Welcome, everybody, in another edition of Inside the Asylum. Uh, Jason, our host, is uh, not able to uh, join us tonight, but I'll be your host, H.R. Baker, and we'll be joined by none other than Waylon Thacker. Waylon, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good, brother. How you doing, man? How'd you How'd your weekend go? Did you uh, How'd you Did you, did you uh, get in on the Bellator action, and uh, what'd you think about it? Oh yeah, man. I thought it was amazing. I mean, Phil Davis has uh, really shown what he can do, and I like where he, you know, accepted that challenge at, with Carmon at the last bit. I mean, I didn't think he was actually going to do it, and he's just a warrior, you know, and he should be uh, making a mark over there. I can't wait for him to uh, lie in the fight. That's going to be great. That's going to be great. I, I'll tell you what, I think Bellator's really stepped their game up, uh, and they just get just keep stepping up and stepping up each time they put on an event. And uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting to see what uh, the the uh, future is for Bellator. But, uh, yeah, I, actually, I uh, covered a fight in Tulsa, the uh, Extreme Fight Night 25, and uh, it was actually kickboxing and mixed martial arts. And, and I'll tell you what, it's just, I mean, nothing but pure excitement. And, uh, of course, anybody that knows me knows I, I love watching these young kids uh, start from the beginning and work their way up. And, and uh, I actually, I've seen a kid in the mixed martial arts portions, and uh, I, I told him I'd give him a shout-out. But uh, just for the fans out there, you want to keep your radar on Kyle Driscoll. He's out of Tulsa. Kid's like 25 years old. He trains with Triton Fight Center with Trey Houston and Dylan Smith. I'll tell you, he improved his record to 3-0 with a knockout in the first round, 57 seconds, and this kid really has a bright future. I'll I tell you what, I was really impressed. And, uh, yeah, keep your eyes out for them. Uh, we got the uh, Excite Fights this weekend. I'm in Oklahoma City right now, and uh, that's going down Saturday night. And, uh yeah, everybody tune in to that. And, uh, but uh, to get on with the show tonight, we have none other than Nate Quarry with us on the uh, Asylum lineup tonight. And, uh, and uh, this will be our what, what, third, fourth episode uh, talking about the uh, Ali Act and, uh, you know, talking about uh, what's fair for the these fighters and uh, how they're treated. And, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And, uh it should be a good show, and we'll see what uh, Nate has to say about it. And and I, you know, I know, I know personally, me personally, you know, I, I don't look at it as bashing uh, the UFC or nothing like that. It's more of you know being fair to these fighters, man. They put their heart and soul exactly. in, in what they do. They step in that cage and they, and they give us fans. I mean, some pure excitement. And and you know, you know, let's let's be fair and let's let's give these guys what they deserve. I mean. But uh, I tell you what, it, uh, uh, let's get started on this, and uh, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Nate Quarry. How are you doing tonight, Nate? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, I'm your host, uh, HR Baker, and we'll be joined with uh, my co-host uh, Waylon Thacker, and uh, we thought we'd you uh, doing, get Nate? your input. Great. So we just want to get your input on uh, what's going around, you know, in the UFC, and and uh, you know, uh, get just get right down to it, you know, about the Ali Act, and uh, and see what uh, you think about it, and uh, what do you think needs to be done. But uh, I'm going to start out by uh, uh, saying that uh, you know, a highly respected, and this, this was uh, quoted on the uh, uh, internet, and. Uh, Highly respected middleweight Matt Leland uh, believes there's something very wrong with the con- contract from the MMA's top organization with Zufa. And, uh, you know, it, it's just plain and simple. You cannot be the promoter and the managers at the same time when they are talking to you uh, who and when you're going to fight. And I want to express a, a, a perfect example it is recently with the uh, Misha Tate was actually told on live TV, she would get a title shot. And days later, Tate, hearing the news on Good Morning America via Ronda Rousey, instead of Tate, she would be fighting uh, Holly Holmes. And, uh, I mean, this is exactly why we need this Ali Act. And do you agree, Nate, or what's your take on that? Oh, 100%. The Ali Act was put into existence to protect fighters 
not only from themselves, but also from these promoters who are definitely going to have an agenda. And as soon as you have a promoter with a financial interest in a fighter, they can manipulate the entire thing. And it becomes less of a sport and more of just entertainment. And Zufa has said from the beginning, they were modeling the UFC after pro wrestling. Well, we understand that when you're trying to do it to reach the the fan base, but mm-hmm. not when you're manipulating the the fights and the bout. And now as they've uh, entered into a suit against Vanderlei Silva, who Vanderlei came out and blatantly says that they have fixed fights. Mm-hmm. I personally have never seen that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the day in court, but we just saw today the big news being released was that Vitor Belford tested positive for steroids and in uh, a, a drug test. The UFC found out about it. Zufa found out about it. Accidentally emailed those results around to the MMA media and a lot of people in the know in the MMA world, and then came out and essentially threatened everyone that got that email, saying, "If you release this information, we will sue you. You'll be in big trouble." You are not the intended recipient of this. And now finally, years later, it comes out that they knew that Vitor Belford was using performance-enhancing drugs. He failed this drug test. They buried the results and continued to go ahead and let him fight. And I believe, and I'm I'm still kind of gathering the facts on this, but I believe it was before his John Jones fight. I, I could be mistaken there, but regardless, they allow him to fight knowing that he's on performance-enhancing drugs not alerting his opponent to this, to even give him the choice, hey, do you want to fight uh, Superman in the cage or, or a normal person? That, to me, is kind of blatant uh, controlling, in some aspect, how the fights go. And that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what things have been done. We've seen with Conor McGregor how they've just blatantly chosen him. He will be the next superstar because he's from Ireland. We want to use him and his name to break into the whole new Irish crowd, fill up the, the arena with Irish fans who are willing to fly over, increase the pay-per-view numbers, and they do it artificially. They don't let Connor do it on his own just by being a great fighter and coming up through the ranks. They manipulate the rankings. They choose who his opponent is going to be, and then they give him backdoor bonuses so he can put together the best fight camps. But I, I even was told that Conor McGregor was flying to the fight on uh, Lorenzo Fertitta's or, or Zufa's private jet while his opponent, Chad Mendez, was flying on Southwest Air. If you want to talk about an unfair advantage there, sitting in coach on Southwest compared to a private jet, I, I think that it's, it's just blatantly unfair what they're trying to do. And the whole point about martial arts in the beginning was just simply, who's best? We're going to take two people, put them in a cage, and we're going to find out who the best fighter is. And now you look at this, well, we're going to give this fighter some extra airtime. We're going to uh, push the sponsors to sponsor him, just like with the three-buck deal, where fighters are losing 90 95% of the money that they were making from sponsors that would go to training camps, to physical therapy, to chiropractors, to uh, supplements, all of these things, <clears throat> so they could put together the best fighter as possible for themselves. Now that money has been stripped away, except in the case of the fighters that Zufa decides is worthwhile. Of. Oh, you can go ahead, uh, uh, Ronda Rousey or Conor McGregor, and have a monster energy sponsor as well, but we're not going to let anyone else do that. So you have this double standard and you have this hypocrisy and just blatantly sending them from what I've heard is just they have a fighter that they want to be a champion. They'll just send them a few extra thousand dollars to help out for their fight camp. We need no, to change the laws. We need to change these regulations so the Ali Act uh, actually covers the UFC fighters, MMA fighters worldwide in actuality. And it's just going to be a battle that they're not going to do it willingly. We have to take it to the courts. Absolutely. Now, uh, Nate, uh, getting back on, on when you part, when you're talking about B4, uh, now, is, is that lean, like uh, the same with Kung Lee? You know, Kung Lee said the uh, UFC repeatedly forced him into situations where he had to fight injured and then botched a drug test. He didn't even really fail. Now, is that more uh, leaning toward the Sherman Antitrust Act than uh, the Ali Act? Uh, there, I think there are two sides of the same coin. 
it, and it's so interesting here <laughs> that you bring up Kung Lee and then Beecher Belford as well, because <laughs> look at look at what Zufa is doing here and how blatant it is that they have an agenda. They have Vitor Belford. They want to, to fight. They want to promote. They have a big pay-per-view coming up. He tests positive on a steroid test that no one is questioning. He failed that test. They sweep it under the rug as if it never happened and threaten those that know about it to be quiet. Then you have Kung Lee, who they botch a drug test against him. It was so blatantly an air drug test that there's no way anyone with half a brain would actually accuse him of, of being on drugs. People that had no idea who Kung Lee was or a big uh, anti-doping organization came out and said that this test is flawed. This is ridiculous. There's no way in hell that Kung Lee was on growth hormone, that the test that, that he supposedly tested positive for was actually low continue, uh, compared to the situation that he was in. To test for a human growth hormone, you need about 12 hours of rest, no food or drink, no excitement whatsoever, because as soon as you engage in physical activity, your body starts producing growth hormone. So they tested him 15, 20 minutes after a brutal fight. He's still bleeding, and they use a mom-and-pop shop in Macau, China, that does a drug tests for, like, teenagers for marijuana and stuff. They have no idea what they're doing. So the drug test comes back with an elevated level. Immediately, they come out and suspend him, not for six months, not for nine months, like they originally said, for an entire year, and just completely throw him under the bus, saying, look at us, we're hard on drugs. We're going to end this guy's, or we're going to put him off for a year because of this test. And then when it comes out that it's complete BS, do they come out and immediately say, we're so sorry, we screwed up, please forgive us. No. Dana White calls Kung Lee and tells him on the phone, I know you're guilty, you just need to come out and admit it. Wow. Just a blatant manipulation of the sport, and I heard that from Kung Lee himself, telling, telling me that he was at the dentist's office while his agent was going to represent him, because again, who do who, who do the fighters go to? There is a botch drug test. There's there's no sanctioning body. The UFC, or even in this case, uh, in other cases with the Nick Diaz thing, the Nevada State Athletic Commission has full sway. Of, they're the dictators of the way things are done. And when we dislike what's been done, we have no one to go to. So Kung Lee had to send his agent to Zufa's offices and stand there and plead their case to Zufa who does not want to come out and say, we're sorry, we screwed up, we made a mistake. No, they're going to try and stick to their guns as much as possible. <laughs> and when it came of clear that, that Kung and, <laughs> and his agent were not going to back down, it's only going to get worse for Zufa, then Dana calls Kung. And, and the way that this went down was just so amazing. So, he, and, and I don't think anyone has actually heard this story. This was the first. It, Kung, well, Kung and first his agent heard told that, me yeah. the same story. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, it, you know, and that re, that reflects uh, John Fitch when you know he was briefly released by the UFC in 2008 for re refusing to sign over his image rights, and then cut yes, him in exactly. 2013 after losing to Damian Maya, and then and his, while his still fight being ranked in the top the ten by the UFC, <laughs> and, and then they release him for that being in the top ten. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's just so. That's just let absurd. me let me tell this story about about Kung Lee. So as as his agent, Gary Barra, who is also my agent, who I've, I've been very close friends for a long time, so he's always telling me what's going on behind the scenes. So Gary Barra goes, meets with Zufa. Zufa's lawyers tell him straight out, we can tell when somebody's on drugs. We can tell just by looking at him. So that was their big thing. And if you talk to Kung, there was a photo that went around while he was in his training camp that made him look really good, athletic and vascular, so everyone thought he was on drugs. Well, if you ask Kung... The first time, now that he's getting older, his metabolism is slowing down. He's actually working with a nutritionist. He's eating properly. He's training properly. And the lighting and the photo had been doctored to make him look really good. So that's where the whole the whole fans were. Nobody was surprised. Oh, of course he's on drugs. No one can look that good because uh, I don't look that good. Uh, he has to be on, on drugs. So Zufa tells his agent, Gary Ibarra, <clears throat> we know he's cheating. We can tell by looking at him. And our agent looks at the Zufa lawyer and says, really, can you tell by just looking at me? You, you have the clairvoyant <laughs> sight, right? You can just tell what everybody, 
is doing, what's internally in their body. So they realize that Kung and his agent are not just going to bend over. <clears throat> uh, Kung, during this, during this meeting, is actually at the dentist. He gets a phone call, sees that it's Dana White, can't take the call. His dentist answers it. I'm working on Kung right now. You'll have to call back. So then Kung calls his, his agent and says, well, what's the story? Why is Dana calling me? And, and his agent, Gary Barra, says, it looks like uh, uh, they have to give in because they have no proof whatsoever. Our side is so overwhelming. But just so you know, when, when Dana calls you, he's probably going to try and harass you, break you down, and record the phone call. So just be aware of that. <clears throat> so Kung says, fine. Calls back to, to Dana's office. Gets the secretary. Oh, let me see if Dana's in. Sorry, he's unavailable right now. Can he call you back? Uh, that's fine. 30 seconds later, Dana's all of a sudden available. Calls back from another line. Is he re- recording the phone call? Who knows? But and Dana are now on the phone, and Dana says flat out, look at all the baseball players that have failed drug tests in the past. Once they come clean and admit their mistake, everyone forgives them. They love them. They move forward. That's what you need to do. We know you're dirty. <laughs> you just need to come out and admit it. And Kong, who is just at this point just filled with rage by being called a liar, by being called a cheater, by having his children attacked online on their social media accounts by so-called fans telling them, oh, your dad cheats, he's such a liar, blah, blah, blah. Kung Lee is now just filled with rage. And to his credit, he just says, Dana, I'm not a cheater. I don't use steroids and hangs up the phone. So here you have the, <clears throat> the pioneer of the sport that everyone says, oh, my God, where, where would MMA be without Zufa? Well, let's see, where would it be? Well, it wouldn't have been voted to be illegal in the state of Nevada when uh, Lorenzo Fertitta voted it down and offered to buy the UFC shortly after that and then got it legalized around the country and then, of course, hired Mark Ratner, who was also on the Nevada State Athletic Commission. There's all these things that go on behind the scenes that the fans aren't aware of, that nobody knows these stories unless you're in these meetings, unless you get this treatment, and it's 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 a sad thing. We want to take it back to it being a sport. And let why is Pacquiao Mayweather so so popular? Because they they go out there and fight, and and the the Ali Act made it to where these guys just go out there and fight, and they win fights, and people want to see these things, as opposed to the way Zufa does things. This is our new star. You're going to love this star. We're going to put them on TV more than anyone else. We're going to make sure they get paid more than anyone else. We're going to make sure they get sponsored more than anyone else. These are our stars. Mm-hmm. It, it's just a blatant manipulation of the sport. Hey, it's, it's not, not too bad when Forbes magazine estimates the value of USC to be around $1.65 billion. So that's not bad for a company that was once $2 million in debt. I mean... <laughs> that's amazing how, how cheaply you can buy something when you make it illegal in the state that they're trying to have their last gasp at doing something. I, I wish I could do that. You, know, you want to sell me a bridge, I'll make sure it's condemned, buy it from you, and then make sure that it passes the next inspection. That, that's, that sounds like a great deal for me. Let me let me make this clear. On uh, You were talking about, uh, Dana said, uh, the baseball players that you know come out and admit, well, that is BS because... You take Mark McGuire, which was tested uh, positive for steroids. You take Bobby Bonds and uh, Roger Clemens, and where are they at now? They are no longer in baseball, and they did not come back to baseball after the that they, after they got tested positive and all that come out. So no, you don't come back when you uh, get tested and, and blah blah blah. You know that, that is BS. So I just want to throw that in there, Nate. <laughs> Yeah, I find mm-hmm. it disgusting. I find it disgusting that Dana White tried to use uh, Kung Lee as a scapegoat for all this nonsense. I mean, that's just like a mob mentality, you know, type person that he is. I mean, he's just a it sounds like a, a yeah, dickhead. Yeah, it really is. And when I and this was, I've become what I consider friends with Kung Lee over the past. I don't know, a year, nine months, something like that. And so I wasn't really friends with him. I was just a fan of Kung's when I first saw the news about him failing a drug test. So I wake up in the morning and I check the MMA Weekly or Sure Dog, something like that, and I see 
Kung Lee fails drug test, tests positive for human growth hormone, the first thought in my mind was, huh, I didn't realize that they had a reliable test for human growth hormone. Why isn't the NFL using it after games or, or the NBA or anything like this? This is really unusual to me. And then yeah. I do some research and I find out, oh, they don't have one. They blatantly manipulate things and make it look like they're leading the industry when in actuality they're pulling things down. Well, Nate, I want to ask you about uh... – I know you and uh, several other, I think Fitch and Silva, I think uh, Ryan Jimmo was even included in this, attended the Collegiate Bowl th- this past year. It's a postseason college football game for the NFL draft, uh-huh. an eligible college yeah. player. How did that yeah. go, and how much did that educate you guys on what, uh, you, know, what you guys are trying to, uh, to accomplish you know, as uh, far as the OLE Act and, and, and learning a little bit about the Players Union and the Associate Players Association, how much did that educate you guys? And was it, uh, was it a big, big uh, plus as far as what we're trying to do here as, as far as a uh, fair game to these uh, fighters? It was fascinating. It, it was set up by uh, Rob Macy, our lead, lead lawyer there, to, to just kind of educate us. And Rob is so passionate about this lawsuit that we have going on, and he understands it. For us, that this lawsuit is really going to help open the door for a fighters association. So he's just kind of helping us along the way. He's not attempting to lead a fighters association. He's just trying to, to support us and educate us. So there's no conflict of interest anyway whatsoever. But he helps us to see these things and being there at the NFL Players Association like I said, it was just eye-opening to hear the story, how they originally came together. And I'm not a union guy. I've never worked in a union. I came up in construction in my entire life. I worked in the fields picking berries. I worked as a janitor through high school. I worked in fast food. I framed houses. I worked at a sign shop. So I've come up in construction, and I always heard a lot of negative things about unions, always mm-hmm. from the bosses never from the workers. I I never knew any union workers. All I ever heard was from bosses saying, oh, my God, these union workers now, they're so lazy. They don't don't work at all. They don't support the company that's supporting them. And I thought, okay, well, I guess that's true. When you you only hear one side of things, you have nothing to compare it to. Well, then getting the NFL Players Association, where they're talking about how the, the very foundation of the Players Association was you had a bunch of football players who were playing you know, three months out of the year, going back to their second job in the off season, so they're making very little money. All they wanted was for their uniforms to be washed in between games, to not have to take their own uniforms home and wash them at home, have their, their wives wash them on the scrub board, I assume, back then. And the owners said then what the owners say now, you greedy bastards. I can't <laughs> believe how greedy and selfish you are. You're playing a game. Do you realize how lucky you are? Anyone out there would kill to have this position. I can't believe how greedy you are. Well, let's flip the tables around, Mr. Billionaire Owner. I can't believe how greedy you are that you get to run an NFL franchise and you want billions of dollars. Don't you know how many people out there would gladly run this NFL franchise for free? And yet here you are, (laughs) worth billions of dollars. And all you want is more. Isn't that funny how that works? That more millionaire more, more, owners yeah. with the, their generational wealth who didn't come up in construction, who I didn't see pushing, uh, working in the field side by side with myself. No, they got the team from their father who got the team from their father. And yet they'll demonize the players and, and they'll play to the lowest common denominator. Oh my God, look at how greedy this guy. NFL player makes $2 million a year to play a game, and he wants more. Isn't that greedy? Well, Mr. (laughs) Owner, you get times that every year without ever suiting up. You get to sit in your office and watch every game and drink and have fun with your friends and and, and make the lion's share of the money. And and I'm a capitalist. I'm all for it. You should make money. But unbridled (laughs) capitalism is what is destroying this country. It was Teddy Roosevelt around 100 years ago that actually stepped in and said, 
We cannot allow the monopolies to control this nation. And that's what we see with the NFL, a monopoly there, with the NBA. The, the thing that breaks my heart the most is these college players who are getting such a ridiculous education, getting no money. So many of the players are actually on welfare because they can't afford to feed their families. And they're told, if you sell your own autograph, we will kick you off the team. Yeah. And you ask, yeah. why is that? Why can't they sell their own autograph? Because it's against the rules. Who made it's these rules? rules? Oh, we did. So you're making up random rules to make sure that your players are starving, to make sure that they have no power, no ability whatsoever to go anywhere else. You just make up these rules randomly. <clears throat> and that's what I see with the UFC, with what Zufa is well, or that's with the the MMA and boxing. I mean, uh, uh, according to uh, old, uh, Mr. Kaplan, uh, he says they're all, uh, really just like apples and oranges, that the business models of boxing and MMA are completely different and says that MMA is actually more akin to Major League Baseball than the NFL and the NBA. Well, you know what? Uh, it's like back in the 70s, and, and I mentioned this when we was interviewing uh, Mr. Marcy, uh, Kurt Flood, you know, who played for the Cardinals for uh, 12 years and a Hall of Famer, and the reason Major League Baseball has free agency said it best, you know, he doesn't want to be owned, you know, you should be able to control your career. And and that's all that we're actually, you know, wanting to see from these fighters, you know, and, and, and their managers and stuff, is, you know, they should absolutely be able to have some kind of control in their career, and they don't. And, and, yeah, and exactly. Absurd. I mean, it's just absurd. It, it, it's like, you know, I, I want to go back to a, a Bellator uh, uh, or a Saturday night, you know, Josh Thompson. He made, what, 100000 They made 10 times more off his sponsors in Bellator than the whole roster at uh, the last UFC fight made off the, off the Reebok deal. Are you kidding me? It's supposed to be the <laughs> biggest sp- stage for mixed martial arts, and they're getting chump change. You know, while Dana White and the Fertitas are just making millions and millions and millions off this, you know. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's just but disgusting. I, I know you, uh, uh, Nate, you mentioned uh, uh, a conflict of interest, and uh, I think this is a good example, and it's the latest uh, going, but uh, Kevin Gasolin versus Matt Brown coming up November the 21st. You know, Gas has mm-hmm. weighed on, on two separate fights, UFC 183, nine pounds over versus Tyrone Woodley, which is my homie. I, I got to uh, give a shout-out to Tyrone. Yes, St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, UFC pushes him uh, to fight at 185. Now Dana White and UFC is paying for a nutritionist to make sure he makes weight at 175 pounds. I mean, 170 pounds. Conflict of interest, I guess. Matt, uh, Matt Brown, what see, he's responsible sport? for his own nutritionist uh, to get ready for this fight. <laughs> What's up with that? I mean, if that's not a Isn't conflict that of interest, then it, it is. I mean, what what other sport could you do that in? Can you imagine <laughs> if if the NBA or or if the NFL if Goodall came out and he said, you know what would be best for the sport if New York and LA were in the Super Bowl together, and you know. That's what's best for the sport. I'm sorry if you don't understand that, but we're going to raise their salary caps by $10 million each. And you, you guys just don't get it. People would go insane. People would lose their mind. The other teams, there would be massive lawsuits, huge conflict of interest. People would, there, there would probably be congressional hearings just so our congressman can, can quit talking about Iran and start <laughs> talking about football for a change. It's yeah, insane. It's in the news. And yet, yeah, here it is, right Dana White blatantly doing that. When, when just saying, oh, yeah, he can't make weight, and because we pay him such little, we're just going to go ahead and pay for a nutritionist to go ahead and run his camp for him and feed him and make sure he gets enough money. I said the exact same thing when Dana said, and this was a couple years ago, I will pay directly Mike Dolce to the, the main nutritionist in the MMA world. <clears throat> I will pay Dolce to work with Cyborg so she can get down to Ronda Rousey's weight. We can put the fight together, the fight the fans want to see. So that's how they sell it. Hey, right, we're, we're doing what's best for the sport. Oh, this is what the fans want to see. Oh, these guys, they, they just don't understand how great this is for the sport. No, that's cheating. That is a blatant violation of ethics and morals. That's not sport. What's next? You know what would be better? If she could punch harder. So we're going to give her brass knuckles. 
I think that was you, you guys just don't understand. This is best for the sport. That's going to put on more of an exciting fight. Oh, and this guy's too good. You know, Ronda Rousey stops her, her, finishes her fights too quickly. So we're going to tie one arm behind her back. You just don't understand. This is what's best for the sport. <laughs> Well, it it know, sounds ridiculous you. when you go out, go out like that, and yet that's what they do. They'll find a fighter and say, yeah, you know, let's just go ahead and give him some extra money behind the scenes. Let's go ahead and pay for his training camp so he can put on the best fight. Well, how does Matt Brown think about that when a fighter who is going to be depleted, who doesn't know, who hasn't put in his own time to learn how to cut weight properly, to, to not eat so much so he's, he's on good, now he's fighting the Superman with, with – an unlimited number of funds. I told that to John Jones when he was sponsored by the UFC. He was wearing UFC gear out. And I looked at him and I said, buddy, that is a blatant conflict of interest. You have the promoter paying you to wear their own clothes. And he looked at me and he said, no one else is complaining about it. And I said, because they can't. Any other fighter that says anything will get the call from Dana. You need to shut the hell up get back in line or your career is not going to go very well for you. And that could be just as simple as we're not going to give him the fights that he wants. He won't fight as often. And because he signed with us, he can't go anywhere. So we now control his career a hundred percent. We'll put him on fight pass where no one will see him. We won't hook him up with any interviews. We won't give him any of the three sponsors. Now that we allow our superstars to have things have got to change. If you want this to really be a sport and not pro wrestling, things have got to change. Got to change. Yeah. You know, since so, so you brought up Cyborg, I mean, and I'm not saying this is right, but you know, the fans, you know, uh, I mean, you got you got to think 90 percent of the fans would rather see a Cyborg and a Rousey fight, but yet, oh he's yeah, willing, you know, he's willing to pay to help Kevin Kevin Gaslin to, to get to 170 pounds. Why not do it to uh, Cyborg? That's the fight everybody wants to see. And I'm not I, saying I don't know right, why they'll make it one. I mean, if you're going to do it, <laughs> let's do it to Cyborg, man. Let's get this fight over with and see who's the who's the pound for pound <laughs> toughest in the world. You know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's be great. a big time bias, uh, conflict of interest. And, um, and, and and you know, here I want to throw in uh, talk about the Reebok a little bit. But uh, Reebok paying the entire UFC roster seventy million over six years. Compared, and I, I'm only uh, saying this because you know it's, they're comparing uh, boxing and MMA to apples and oranges, and it's more uh, uh, akin to the NBA and this and that. Well, James Harden's getting 200 million from Adidas, which owns Reebok for 13 years. What's up with that? I mean, that insane. Isn't that <laughs> just insane? And I mean, the Reebok deal as well. They kept Dana again, once again, comes out and says, first off, you guys don't understand. This is what's best for the sport. All this money is going to the fighters. How greedy can they be? Well, wait a minute. And no, wait, you had to actually hire people to manage the money and manage these things. So already we're taking salaries out for more Zufa employees. So the money is not going completely to the fighters. And then they come out and say, oh, and we're giving some of the money to charity. Well, wait a minute. If I'm starving, I prefer to feed my family first before you give it to a charity that you've chosen. For all I know, it's the the Dana White Kids Fund to make sure that they have the latest video games. Who knows? And then it comes out that a lot of the the supposed money that's going to the fighters is in gear. So now they're getting crappy, horrific Reebok gear that nobody wants. Nobody's worn in a decade. And that's part of their compensation. It's just insane that these things are, are peddled to the, the fighters and the fans. Tim Kennedy came out a few weeks ago in his last fight in Strike Force. He said that he made more in Strike Force in his fight than the entire card did from Reebok. <clears throat> well, let's look at this. And if you really want to build superstars, if you want to get the big pay per view numbers, why would you want just one company representing your brand, your your UFC? It makes no sense. Absolutely. They have a limited budget. They're going to choose Absolutely. three or four guys like they have, and they're prettiest people. They're choosing people that, that aren't even champions. The champions are complaining. Like, why are we getting passed over? Oh, because she's prettier than I am. Okay. How does that make sense? And take, <laughs> take my last fight, for example, five and a half years ago. On Spike TV, I wasn't ranked in the top 10. I wasn't fighting for the world title. I made around $45,000 
in sponsorship money alone. I made more in sponsors than I did from the UFC, from Zufa in my payday. Why did I make that much? Because of the way I carry myself. And that other companies said, we want to associate our brand with this man. We think that it will be mutually beneficial. Well, according to the Reebok deal, I'm worth $5,000. So it would have been a 90% pay cut for me. So you, you go ahead and you look at my little girl when I don't have money for her to go to college and I still have to live in a bad neighborhood and tell her, oh, you just don't understand. It's what's best for the sport to have just Reebok as a sponsor. Sorry. We've starved our time. I literally would have made more money staying in construction than I did fighting for the UFC directly from their paydays. It was the sponsorships that saved us because I had companies that said, we want to associate our name with him and won and won uh, basketball shoes. I was the first guy to be sponsored by a big clothing or a shoe company like that. And they put in a, a two page spread in one of the big shoe magazines. So we're hitting a completely different demographic. We're showing everyone out there that, and one applies to fighters as well. Uh, the people that were mostly interested in basketball, they're starting to see fighters in their magazine. Well, after about a year, the UFC called and one and said, if you want to continue sponsoring Nate Corey in the cage, you have to pay us $50,000. Wow. And they just went, are you kidding me? That is that blast through our budget. Secondly, you're billionaires. We don't want to pay you any more money. We want to support him and his journey. So they came to me and said, sorry, buddy, I guess if, if we can't sponsor you in the cage, that's the number one time we would get exposure for our brand. I'm sorry, I guess we're going to have to end this relationship. And then the deal became $100,000. So now you went from an unlimited number of clothing <laughs> sponsors and supplement sponsors to only the sponsors that could afford to pay Zufa a hundred grand for that privilege. So you washed away 99% of, of all the sponsors. So now you have three or four sponsors in the cage. And there was, I was talking to one fighter who just a few years ago was sponsored by dethroned for his shorts alone. He got paid $12,500 to wear his shorts into the cage. His last fight before the Reebok deal, he was paid $250 by the same oh company, by the ground. I've got a few examples. Because why on would the... they pay more? Why would they pay more money when they know we've only got four shorts companies you can choose from? Venom, Dethrone, Tap Out, whoever else. Yeah. And yeah. If, especially if you're an up-and-coming fighter or you know, they just tell you, yeah, sorry, we've already gone through our budget for the year. We can give you some shorts. Or you can go naked. We don't really care. <laughs> yeah. I've got hey, Nate, this is Waylon Thacker, UFC. man. I've been a fan of yours ever since I saw you on the Tough uh, season one. I know you got injured and all that stuff, which was pretty – it sucked. I really wanted to see you fight, but I really liked how you talked Chris Levin and um, calmed him down through that Bobby Stoppler situation and the Josh Koscheck uh, thing. But um, I was reading that you started uh, – you got into sports when you was 24 years old. And I ask all the fighters this whenever they come on the on, on the show, but um, – when did you get into mixed martial arts, and what made you want to get into it? Yeah, that was it. I was 24 years old. I was at a party, and these guys came up to me, and he said, Hey, man, there's these guys beating the hell out of each other in a cage on TV. And I was <laughs> like, What? Who would do that? That's just craziness. And I go inside, and I see Hoist and Ken going at it, and I was just amazed. I, I never knew that that something like that existed. And I was raised in, in basically a cult. I was raised as a Jehovah's witness where yeah. I was not allowed to do any sports whatsoever. I was not allowed to have any friends outside of the Jehovah's witness organization. While all the other kids were out uh, wrestling and playing football and all that, I was going door to door, bothering people in their homes on Saturday and Sunday mornings with the watchtower awake, trying to convert people. So in my early twenties, I just said to myself, I am miserable. I hate this life. I, I, for the first time in my life, I want to do what I want to do with my life. And after seeing the UFC on TV, I just said, that's what I'm going to go do. And I had so much rage built up inside of me from my childhood. I was able to channel it in MMA. And it was just, a, just an incredible thing to now be a part of this community with these people who are supportive and we're working towards, towards fights and learning and just having fun and, no matter what, 
you know, I'm fighting to change the treatment of the fighters by Zufa, but I love the sport. And I, I'm so thankful to be where I'm at today that all of my work in, in my point of view is paid off. And, and I hear some people say, oh, you're just bitter. You're just trying to get something you don't deserve. That couldn't be further from the truth. I'm so thankful to be where I'm at today and so thankful that I didn't get into the UFC now where I, it wouldn't have even been possible to have a career because I, I just couldn't have afforded it. There, there was no way with, with being a single father and having a daughter, I couldn't exist on what Reebok is paying and what the UFC is paying combined. It just wouldn't happen. So I'm very thankful that I was in the sport at the right time and was able to be on the ultimate fighter. And now I'm able to be a voice for these fighters that are struggling and who feel hopeless, who, who signed these contracts maybe five years ago when things were a lot better in UFC. And now it's been completely regulated down to where they're just barely scraping by, if at all. I, I've spoken to fighters who are losing money to fight in the UFC who are just trying to get through their contract so they'll be free and they can go elsewhere or maybe renegotiate and try and get some, some money so they could put food on the table. So I'm, I'm trying to be their voice, speak for the, those that can't at this point. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of young fighters retire at the age of 26. And I think it's just because they don't want to, you know, be tied down to the UFC anymore and they'd rather go elsewhere and make way more money, you know, but you got a lot of heart. And I saw that during the, uh, back in, let me see, September 9, 2007, whenever you fought Pete Sell. And that was mm-hmm. one of the best knockouts I've ever saw. I mean, you just, you you was just all bloodied up. You was the epitome of a, you know, mixed martial artist. Like, whenever I see the photos of what an MMA fighter should look like, he was all bloodied up and you had a dude laying at your feet pretty much. Uh, that was one of the greatest <laughs> knockouts I've ever seen. What was your highlight of your career? That was it. That day was the most important day in my life and in my daughter's life because yeah. it had been 22 months since my, my previous fight where I'd fought for the world title against Rich Franklin, got brutally knocked out. <clears throat> Three months later, I couldn't pick up my little girl. My lower back, I have a degenerative disc disease. And in my lower back in the lumbar at vertebrae L2, L3, the disc in between had completely collapsed. And I had wow. bone on bone grinding. So it's almost like if you had no cartilage in your knee, you can imagine how bad it hurts. Well, I had that in my back. And I just got so fortunate to find the right doctor that was doing this new procedure that was a minimally invasive surgery called an X-Lift, extreme lateral interbody fusion. And it gave me my life back. But still, I had to go from this brutal knockout to needing back surgery to overcoming my fears of back surgery, a spinal fusion. And then returning to fighting shape, getting back into the UFC and fighting Pete Sell, who I knew was angry. He was riding a lot of momentum. He had Matt Sarah, who was the champ at the time, in his corner. <clears throat> I showed up in Vegas for the fight with all the money I had in the world in my pocket and $25,000 in credit card debt. And I was fighting for 10000 to show and 10000 to win. So the best case scenario there was I'd leave Vegas and $5,000 in debt. And the worst case scenario would be he'd knock me out in the first round and I'd lose my UFC contract and, and all of that would have been for nothing. And he beat the hell out of me for, for two rounds. And at the start of the third round, I looked across the ring and I just said to myself, if I don't finish him now, this was all for nothing. Because I knew I was yeah. losing the fight. He dropped me in the second, hit me with a big right hand and just put me on my backside. <clears throat> and I popped up just thinking, don't stop this fight. It was one of those moments where, yes, if you asked me in between rounds, you may die in this fight. Do you want to continue? I would have said, hell yes, without a question, yeah. because I knew it was my future. And more importantly, it was my daughter's future writing on that. I'd gone yeah, you could tell by looking at back you. surgery. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and and just knowing what, everything we had resting on that on that moment. And winning that fight, I got my show money. I got my win bonus. I got fight of the night bonus. I got knockout of the night bonus. And it really was. And then I also became this ultimate spokesman for what's possible after back surgery. Because everybody mm-hmm. everybody knows if you have back surgery, your life is over. You'll never pick up your kids again, work a car, work in the yard. Your life is over. Well, no. Now, here I am with a spinal fusion. I've got two vertebrae at the time fused in my back. Now, I've got four because I've had another spinal fusion. But having two vertebrae fused in my back at the time, and here I am fighting in the UFC live on Spike TV. It was just something 
unheard of it. Now I'm, I still work with the company as their spokesman, but more importantly, I work with uh, a group called the better way back. And I'm able to reach out to people that are suffering that have back yeah. pain and have no hope and let them know what, whatever your doctor says, I, I, I don't give advice. I don't diagnose people. I just am the voice that, yeah, there is hope out there. You don't have to live in pain for years and years. So I think about that day and, and the turnaround in my life and being able to provide for my daughter. And it was when I, I made it back to Oregon and the checks cleared, which was a whole nother story because they put a hold on my checks for three weeks, which was just <laughs> horrific. <laughs> I'm walking around with, see, I, I had $20 in my pocket after the fight and I go to cash my checks and I put a three week hold on them and they give me a hundred dollars. I had to spend wow. $80 to get my car out of the parking lot at the airport. The gas light was on in my truck, so I had to fill up my tank. I was rolling off bare on one side, six of flat on the other. The belts were showing on the other tires, and I had to drive an hour to go pick up my daughter, and I had nothing. I had no food money. And I was so fortunate that a friend of mine that had a restaurant let us eat there for free that night so we could celebrate. But when my checks did clear. I picked up my little girl from school and I took her to the mall and I got down on one knee and I looked her in the eyes. And at the time she was, I guess, seven, somewhere around there, six or seven. I got down and I looked at her and I said, ever since we started this journey of me being a professional fighter and, and following my dream, we have lived on next to nothing. And you've never complained once. So now you're going to go into that store and you're going to buy whatever you want. Oh, that's and her awesome. eyes just got so big and she looked at me and said really and I said yes <laughs> let's go and she she runs into the store and she grabs a shirt with a big lion on and she goes daddy daddy how much is this and I said it doesn't matter if you want it you you get it it's yours you've earned it and it's yeah. it's those moments that that don't get the the highlights no one sees those things happening for a lot of people <clears throat> I remember uh one one fighter who's now a commentator for the UFC I won't mention his name was telling me how mad that he was at Dana. He just won a, a fight, and he was paid so little, and Dana comes up to him and says, man, you're going to be such a huge star. And he was just wanting to tell Dana, I don't care. <laughs> That's a good I want to feed my family. I want yeah. to feed my family. And people want to be famous that aren't famous. People that are hungry want food more than fame. And when you're pursuing a dream, like we all are, this is a choice of ours. I could have quit at any time and gone back to construction, but it would be really nice to be able to live your dream and also feed your family at the same time, especially when the boss is is dropping a $10,000 tip to his waiter, uh, playing blackjack with $150,000 a hand. Those are the kind of things that make you go, oh, so really they just don't care about us at all. It's all about them. That's what it's all about. It's, it's heartbreaking to see those things. Hey, Nate, this yeah. is Skippy fan calling in. I, I got a question. I've been listening to this amazing interview, and I love what you're saying. There's a, a fighter from your neck of the woods. You, you probably grew up around him, or at least around the crew he was, Jeff Munson. He he is taking mm -hmm. this sport, and he has kind of done it his way, completely different than everybody else. One fight contracts, seminars at every city. As a fighter looking back today, do you respect his decision to walk <laughs> away from – you know, trying to chase the UFC dream and, and go the route he did? Very much so. And, uh, yeah, I've known Munson a long time. And he is. He is he's definitely an individual who marches to the beat of his own drum. So I support 100% those types of, this, of decisions. A big part of the Ali Act is really helping boxers, protecting them from ourselves. And I, I'm not college educated. Like I said, I came up in, in the fields working with the migrants. And I'm, I'm not talking I was running the crew. No, I was right there picking berries for, I forget how much it was, 10 cents a pound or something like that, and insulating houses, that kind of stuff. I, I didn't even know a college graduate until I started fighting. And then that was meeting guys like Couture, who their college degree was in wrestling, essentially. So I didn't know enough. I, in all honesty, and this is, <laughs> this is going to come off as a joke because people say that I sound fairly intelligent on occasion, I did not know what the term in perpetuity meant when I signed with the UFC. I had no idea. 
And I'm sitting there in, in Dana's office during the filming of The Ultimate Fighter. And Dana said, we realize we don't have anyone except the winners of the finale under contract. So we want to make sure that we have the option to see you guys as well. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I, I don't know if this is a good idea or not. And there's this big contract in front of me. And I don't understand any of it. And Dana looks at me and goes, don't worry. If this thing takes off, we'll take care of you. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'm a man of my word, so obviously he must be too. Yeah. Not realizing that, no, the real world, you have to get those things in writing. Me, I would be so embarrassed to say something that didn't come true, to put my, my word, my honor out there and then have somebody say, yeah, he's a liar. Yeah, he didn't do what he, he was going to do. And again, I, I couldn't be happier with my career. I, I guess I, I probably could but I'm very happy with where I came from to be where I'm at today. My goal is to train, to change the entire sport. So the next generations of fighting are getting their due share. Well, you're very inspiring. I mean, what you did with that, <clears throat> with the situation with uh, Jacob Beckman, I mean, that was, I've never really cried watching anything, you know, let alone, um, you know, a fight. But whenever I saw that thing with Jacob Beckman, and you, I was, I, mean, I almost got the tears. I was just like, whoa, man. I mean, what? A, first of all, what a, a great, humble humble guy to do this. And just to give somebody a dream, a shot to do this, to fight in a, in a cage and, you know, just live his dream. I like how he walked out, walked inside the octagon like John Bones Jones, you know. Uh, that, was, that was awesome, like how he crawled in there. But I was just like, whoa, this is just amazing. You know what I mean? I wish everybody could see this. The whole world needs to see it because... You don't see that every day, you know, and um, how did you get that started? Like, how did that come to town? It was, honestly, it was really simple. And I'm the kind of guy that I feel if I can do right by somebody, that it's my duty to do right by them. And so I was traveling, I believe I was in Texas at the time, and I just see this Facebook feed where they're talking about this this kid who's 19 years old, who's been training for three years, every every time he trains, he asks his coach, when when can I fight for the world title? I want to be the UFC champion. But yeah. he's got Down syndrome. So they said, yeah, sorry, buddy, that's just not in it for you. And they were kind of talking about, oh, how cool it would be if we could actually get him a fight with some, and he could live out this dream. And I sat there and I looked at that and I went, well, why can't he? Everybody should be able to follow their dream. I'm free. I can I can do that. That's no big deal. And so I just sent a message and I said, yeah, I'll do it. And that was it. It took me like 30 seconds to look yeah. at this and go, well, why wouldn't I do that? I've been given so much. And I could sit down and I could go, oh, look, at I, I've been through eight surgeries, two spinal fusions. I've got 13 screws in my face. I had my first coach tell me I was no good and I never would be. I've had more knives plunged into my back than I can count. <clears throat> and yet I still consider myself to be so incredibly lucky that I didn't end up like so many other people I know. So me being that lucky, I thought, well, why can't I? Why can't I give back? If I can do the smallest thing to help somebody live their dream, why wouldn't I do that? And not only to help him, uh, help Jacob realize his dream as a fighter, but to help his mother as well to realize what would it be like if, if her son was just like the rest of us, that there were no limitations on what he could do. And then even to show support to the, the whole community for special needs people that, yeah, we may not understand what you're going through, but we'll try to empathize and we'll try to help you as much as we possibly can. And I was really surprised myself at how much, how much attention that whole thing got. It was on the front page of the, the newspaper in Oregon, the Oregonian. It was the number one shared thing on Facebook the Monday after the bout. It just, it really, it really took me by surprise because to me it was just like, oh, yeah, so we got a kid who wants to live his dream. Cool. I'm, I'm free that day. To me, it, it'd be almost like helping a blind person cross the street. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a hand. To me, it was just just that simple of a thing. And to see the boy in his face and when we got together, we trained a couple times before the fight just to make sure I wanted to see – what he was good at, what kind of tools he would use, and, and what, what he wanted for me, what his mother wanted for me, what his coach wanted for me. And, you know, in retrospect, I guess there probably could have been some – it could have gone poorly. 
Oh, he's had hip surgeries. He, he could have been injured, something like that. My number one priority was to make sure that he didn't get injured. And way down the line, number two was me not getting injured. But I, as, as I said in one of the interviews, I'm more than happy to take a couple punches if it helps a, a good-hearted young man fulfill his dream. And it, it was it was great for me to have my team together downstairs at the Roseland Theater, and I had my Muay Thai coach, uh, Mr. Dan Burke, there holding pads for me. And I wanted to get warmed up so I didn't hurt anything. So I was throwing some punches and some kicks, <clears throat> and my girlfriend came up to me and said, Jacob's right there watching you, and he is scared to death. He just asked his coach if you're going to hit him like that. And so when I was done, I went over to Jacob and I said, Jacob, man, I'm just warming up. This is what fighters do. We just warm up. You don't worry about nothing. This night is all about you. You just go out there and you fight. And I took him upstairs. And before the fight, we walked around the cage. And I said, as soon as you get into the cage, this whole crowd is going to be screaming and yelling your name. They're going to be so excited you're here. This night's all about you. So you got to run around the cage, blowing kisses, waving at them. And that's exactly what he did. He had his, his sunglasses on. He came up running around. And first round, he's throwing punches and shooting takedowns and locked in an ankle lock and almost had it, almost made me tap. But I got saved by the bell, and the second round starts. And he comes out stronger in the second round than he did the first, throwing bombs. Yeah, he was. He was down. hitting you hard. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's crazy. Yep. Yep. I threw a jab just kind of at his chest and he over the top and just clipped me on the jaw. Yep. But he, he locked in the ankle lock and I had to tap in the second round. And, you know, once again, I, I try for a UFC belt and, and fall short, but it was for a good cause at least. Yeah. It was a beautiful thing, man. A beautiful thing to watch. <clears throat> oh, thank you. So are you hey, friends with Bobby know. Southworth? <laughs> <laughs> Am I friends with Bobby Southworth? Yeah. Well, I was just down in, in Texas, and I was uh, going around doing some speaking engagements for the better way and, and going and talking to some doctors and some patients who just need some support as they're considering getting back surgery. And what I like to do is I'll go to some gyms down there, and I'll put on a seminar and then talk about my journey. And so they – at the, the UFC gym down there in Texas, in uh, San Antonio, Brook Hollow, where Bobby Southworth is one of the coaches. They opened up the doors and, and let me come in to, to do my do my class and kind of give my talk. And Bobby was right there helping me the whole time. And That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. You know, ten years ago, or whenever the – yeah, I think it was ten years ago, the Open Fighter, we obviously had our differences. But after seven weeks of being locked in the house with – no radio, no TV, no outside influences, that'll definitely get to you. It really brings out the worst in people. And yeah. so just looking at it as, yeah, that was just another part of our lives. It was something that, you know, I'm I'm happy that I did it, no matter how miserable it was at the time. So I think just kind of letting those things go, and I don't want to be the kind of guy that carries around anger and, and things, especially over stupid things like a reality show for the rest of my life. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, Nate. I want to. My message board is blowing up with fan questions, and I want to make sure I get get a couple of these fan questions out here. But uh, first, I wanted to hit on uh, the Nick Diaz. Uh, what's going on with Nick Diaz? You know, are you hearing the fighters in the flyweight divisions refusing to fight in uh, Nevada, uh, and along with some of the others like Leslie Smith and Henry Cudo? Is that uh, possibly a step? If this is true, and these fighters refusing to fight in Nevada, could this be a step actually in the in the in the direction of the Ali Act concerning the Ali Act and the and uh, you know what I mean and giving fighters yeah. the uh, the uh, uh, sensibility to uh, you know join in and say, hey man, if they can do it, we can do it, you know. And <clears throat> do, do you believe that's, that is that's exactly a possibility or? That's exactly the case, and this is what has been driving me crazy my entire life. If you don't like something, I guarantee you there's a few million other people that don't like it too. <clears throat> we have so much strength as a group. It's just a matter of everybody believing in the change and making it happen. So if you don't like something, especially if, if, if the fighters didn't like the Reebok deal, they could change it with a snap of their fingers by every single one of the fighters saying, 
we're not going to wear this. We that's refuse. The, that's where the we're not going to association fight. come in, and, and uh, I mean, it's not so much exactly. as going unionized, but just having a fighters association to uh, have exactly. a leader to speak up for the fighters, and, and that's that's. Uh, yep. Yep. That's and, just and, but the UFC does there. what the UFC Zufa does what what all owners do, just like we talked about with the NFL. They demonize the players. Oh my God, these guys are so greedy. We're giving them twenty five hundred dollars to wear a shirt. Isn't that insane? They're, they're so greedy. Well, how much are you making from the Reebok deal? How much are you making every single night of the pay-per-view while you're just sitting there watching? Huh. Oh, can you believe this? Dana White's making millions of dollars just sitting there watching fights. Wouldn't that be cool? I bet you'd watch those fights for free. Hell, you'd probably yeah. pay for them. So they don't ever present that. So, yeah, having the fighters actually realize the strength that they have and coming out and saying, this is unfair the treatment that the fighters are getting, we don't have any representation. We need to change things. This is a step in the right direction. It's so often I've stood for the right thing and stood alone. It's very disheartening when you're standing there. Just like when I left Team Quest, the entire team of athletes there was bitching and complaining. We don't have any coaches. All we do is show up and beat each other up every practice, and we're giving them $1 out of every five that we make 20% of our income goes to the management when they're, they're not negotiating our contracts. They're not calling around finding us fights. All we're doing is showing up and beating each other up. So I went and I represent the entire team per their request to try and get some changes made. And when I was told, if you don't like it, pack up your bags and leave. You're no longer welcome here. I went back to the team and I said, hey, guys, they don't want to budge. So let's take our 20% that we were paying them. And we'll just get our own coaches, and we'll go to another gym. I've got a huge basement. We could just train there. Our our income just went up twenty percent. And guess what? We'll we'll make we'll win even more fights because now we'll have better training, better coaches. And every single fighter there said, "Oh, well, we didn't realize that you were actually going to go talk to them." Oh, well, it sounds like they're upset. No, no, we're we're fine. I was like, "Cool, (laughs) okay, guys. Well, congratulations." on ending your career here at a dead-end gym. And that's what I saw happen. And it was, it's been so amusing to me that guys that were even the loudest in the UFC, guys that were saying how gangster they are and how tough they are, were the first ones to tuck tail and just sit around bitching and complaining and not doing anything to change it. So it, it's very disheartening to try and stand up for change when you realize most people are, are more comfortable being comfortably miserable is what I call it. They're happy sitting around and complaining instead of taking a chance and risking happiness by taking a chance by believing in themselves and and going for change. I'm not the kind of guy that's going to sit around and bitch around behind somebody's back. If I can change something, I'm good. And when I see see fighters that they're more than happy just to sit there and and complain and be miserable instead of actually trying to change things, it's very disheartening. And I think it flies in the face of what martial arts is supposed to actually be about. Exactly. Do you feel like the the? I mean, I know this is going to happen. I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but do you feel like it's it's a call to action for termination? And and who would you, right off, the top of your head, would like to see a replacement of the leader of Zufa? Oh, geez. You ever seen those uh, clapping monkeys with the symbols? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think if you wound that up, it'd probably uh, give a better interview than, than Mr. White. <laughs> no, that, no, I'm kidding. I, in all well, honesty, you know, if you look at the way that – when you see the way that he treats the fans, if you look at his Twitter page where he's calling fans, he's calling his customers names, things that fighters yeah. under the Zufa banner did – would get them suspended, not cut, because if they cut them, they'd go to Bellator, they'd go someplace else. So they just randomly suspend them for indefinite periods of time. It's just insane. And we've seen him call reporters the C word. Mm -hmm. I'll try to keep my tongue, although I hate using abbreviations, or the the F word and, and things like that. It's just in no other sporting organization are you supposed to know who the promoter is. It's supposed to be about the fighters. Nobody is buying a pay-per-view because Dana White is going to be sitting cage side. It's about the fighters. 
So you really don't need anyone of any that that special of a talent. You need somebody that can just not give an offensive interview. That's about exactly. it. Exactly. There's been talk of, of someone like Rich Franklin coming up and doing it. And I'm sure That's anything that. that Rich chose to do, he would be phenomenal at. He's always been, other than one night, he's always been really cool to me. I think he'd be phenomenal at, at stepping into that. And then you'd have somebody who also knows what it's like to be a fighter that could be in that arena. I was going to say that'd be a prime candidate for optimizing the organization, you know, for the better and fixing the issues. But, you know, you know like you were talking about, uh, you know, the, 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 the Zufa leader, it, he's becoming, I'm not even becoming, he is a casualty of his own uh, UFC fighter code of conduct. I mean, it's just a matter of time. I mean, you look at his history and, and it shows you, you know, the, Evitability of, of the missteps again. He, you know, again and again. It's, it's through the, whether it's through the social media bullying and sexism, or by the uh, immoral treatment of the MMA media. I mean, that that uh, covers his sport. I yeah, mean, it's just uh, exactly. And <laughs> and and now that there's there's the talk of all the new drug testing that the fighters had no input on whatsoever. Why don't we expand that a little bit, and we'll also drug test the Zufa employees as well. So let's start drug testing. You know, testing that was my next and, question. And, about, and the other owners. <laughs> do you think, as far as the drug testing goes, that the executives and people at the top should to be drug tested? I mean, if drug testing is good enough for the fighters, <laughs> why not for the people who enforce the companies? Uh, Zufa code of conduct. I mean, why not call exactly. for drug testing of executives? <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah, they're the ones that, making that the decisions that affect the lives of the fighters. I mean, it seemed like it would only be fair, but, but uh, it seems like it's very much the "do as I say, not as I do" type of mentality. Exactly. Yeah. I was that's, talking that's to what, to a former executive who had left the UFC to go elsewhere, and they told me the attitude there is: we're in the worst recession of a hundred years. You're lucky to have a job, and we might fire you tomorrow. And exactly. I basically heard that same speech before every fight. Get out there and we'll fight hard, at, uh, or we're going to cut you. Well, look at the way they did Stitch. I mean, <laughs> come on, Stitch. I mean, the best best in the business. And just because you mentioned something about uh, that, that, that's just absurd. I mean, and, but you know, while we're on the uh, uh, and on the uh, drug testing, what do you think about the uh, anti-doping program that they got? Uh, you know, the effort to clean up, uh, you know, the juicing and stuff in the UFC. You know, they brought in UFC uh, Vice President of Athlete Health and Performance, Jeff Novotitsky. Novotitsky, I think that's how you had it right. And, and it's like these guys Honestly, who you got to report in like, uh, like they're in high school, you know, like, I don't know, what's up yeah, with that? Yeah, I don't um, know. I don't know a lot about the new policies, but I do know that basically putting a dog collar on all the athletes, treating them like their children where they have to report in at any time. And it, and it just blows me away that, that Zufa will have enough money to do these types of things, but not <laughs> to actually pay the fighters so where they can take care of themselves. If it yeah, they want to know where they're at all or not. They want to know where they're at during the day. And then, you know, it, yeah. if, if they can't be used uh, through their mobile, uh, through a, a mobile app, I guess, that they have set up, it's like, you know, the uh, the first time a fighter fails to identify where he or she is, merits a call from Novinsky. Well, the second time, Novinsky flies to where the fighter is and trails him for a day, I guess, you know, uh, spies on him for a day or two, and uh, makes sure they are, are filling the app correctly, I guess, that they, they receive on their phone. And the third time, fighters face uh, sanctions. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Just insane. <laughs> And and look at the hypocrisy here, where they come out and say, look at how tough we are on drugs. Unless, of course, it's a champion who's going to fight for for a fight for us, like, uh, you know, John Jones testing positive for cocaine, or <laughs> Vitor Belford testing positive for testosterone. Other than that, we're really tough on drugs, unless you make us a lot of money. Talk about hypocritical. Their, their exactly. credibility has just gone out the window. And if it was me, if I was in charge of these things, I would set up a standard. I would just I would go at whatever the athletic commission says needs to be done because it's not my job 
to babysit the fighters all the way around. There's there's a reason why these rules are already in place. I'm not going to screw it up by trying to to show the world, oh, look at how tough we are on crimes, especially when you're not doing it when it matters most. You really want to show that you're tough on crime, tough on drug use? Suspend John Jones when he tests positive before a title fight. Suspend Vitor <laughs> Belfort before he tests positive before it. A title fight. These things are just insanity that they do this. But we've seen that over and over again, especially with the code of conduct. When you had, was it Forrest Griffin and Rashad Evans were making off-color jokes on Twitter, nothing was done. But then you had a lightweight fighter who didn't who didn't move the needle when he was fighting, gets cut from the UFC right away. And then they come out with a big statement: "We're not going to tolerate things like this." No, you are, as long as you make the company money. That's blatant. It's, it's ridiculous. All right, Nate, I want to get to a couple of these fan questions real quick before we we start to wrap up. But uh, Okay, on the weight cutting, do you feel that Amis are cutting too much weight? And if so, what do you do to correct it? I think the amateurs they should do whatever the rules allow them to do. So everybody looks at the athletes as if we're part of the problem. If you give us the scenario to work in, we're not the problem. You are. If you're weighing guys in 30 hours before their fight and the weight classes are 20 pounds apart, you're going to get what you're going to get. If you want to change it, have day of weigh-ins. Make it that simple. Have them weigh in as they walk into the cage and have a, have a five-pound barrier. Your weight class is from 170 to 175. You know exactly where you're going to be. You step on the scale. You walk into the ring. You fight. It's just that simple. If you want to change the way weight cutting is done, change the rules. Don't demonize the fighters once again. They pass these rules that are just insane. They make these regulations and then blame the athletes for exploiting them to the fullest of their ability. I walked around at 205, 210 pounds. I fought at 185. Why? Because everybody else in my weight class was 210 pounds. I would have loved to have walked into the cage and not had to cut weight, walk in at 205 pounds, see an opponent that also weighs 205 pounds. That's not the case. If I was fighting at 205, my opponent would be 240. I fought Drew McFedries in Idaho for Monty Fox's show. We had an agreement of a catch weight, and the catch weight was basically what we weighed that morning. We both woke up, we went in, we just hopped on the scale. I think I weighed in around 202. He was right around there as well. So we weighed the same amount and we fought. There was no weight cutting or anything like that. It was just, that's what we were going to do. So if you want to make it so guys can't weigh 20 pounds more than the weight class, <clears throat> put that in the rules. Night of the fight, we're going to weigh you. You show up at 4 p.m., you fight at 7 you have to be between 170 and 175. If you're not, your fight is scratched. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple. Okay, I got another question. I think uh, uh, Skippy, our vice president, kind of hit on this earlier when he come on, but uh, on the pro contract, do you, do you think a fighter should look to fight a home to – excuse me. Do you think a fighter should look to find a home with a long-term contract as a young pro or look to do one fight contract and try to travel to different regions to face different fighters? Long-term contracts are the worst thing a fighter can do in their career. And I see this. I, I saw a, a fighter recently who was so excited, and, and they're a smart guy too, saying, oh, my God, I just I signed an eight-fight contract with the UFC. And so I messaged him, and I said, oh, that's great. So if you win five fights in a row, you can renegotiate and get a raise, right? Well, no. Oh, okay, well, at least they can't cut you, right? It's an eight-fight, no-cut contract. Uh, no, they can cut me at any time. Okay, well, they can't change anything, right? I mean, you can wear your sponsors for forever, right? They can't make you wear Reebok. No, I, I have to wear what, what they tell me to. Okay, so what you're telling me is that it's a completely one-sided contract where they have control of your entire career, what you wear, uh, your everything, and you have no say whatsoever. You can't leave no matter how bad the deal gets. He's like, yeah. It's like, cool, congratulations. You gave them exactly what they wanted. The key to success in the sport is, number one, <clears throat> fight for the love of fighting. No matter what you do, if you love what you do, whether you make a dime 
or $10 million, you've been successful because you love what you do. And fighting is way too hard to do it for any other reason. You want women, you want money, you want fame, you want all that stuff, join a band. It's a lot easier. You can drink at work. There'll be plenty of women there fighting. (laughs) You're in pain all the time. You get paid next to nothing. You have to deal with promoters. It's terrible. Do it for the love of the sport. Two, treat it like a business. Because if you don't treat it like a business, the promoter is, your agent is, your coaches are, and they will take advantage of you. And at the end of your career, you'll be left broken, broken. Do it for the love of the game. Treat it like a business. Make the big show call you. You don't call them. You get to the point where you're so good that the organizations now are clamoring to get you into their show. It's really simple. I think you. I think you'll be That's familiar with this phase. Is is uh, I love to fight, but I don't like who's in control. It's kind of like the movie uh, Born on the Fourth of July. Tom Cruise stated at the end, "I love my country, but yep. I hate its leaders." <laughs> yeah, I know you're yep. familiar and with I, that. I, right? Okay. <laughs> yes, and I, I've actually used that line a few times, yeah. and it, it is yeah. so. It, it means so much, especially right now with our current state of our our country and our government where you have somebody like donald trump stepping in and i think it's more of it's not that everybody really loves donald trump i think it's that they just hate the politicians that we have and we're so happy that it's just shaking it up and it's the same thing with mma we're we're just so disgusted at these promoters zufa especially that are doing everything they can to squeeze every nickel out of every promotion every show every sponsor to the expense of the fighters the actual workers and it's the fighters. We are the blue collar guys. We're on the line. You know, you don't see us making appearances wearing five thousand dollar suits and and thirty thousand dollar watches. You know, I, I posted something on <clears throat> on Face the other day where there's this NFL player making. I, I'm not sure how much he was. It may have been the league minimum, half a million dollars a year, and may have been a, may have been a bigger contract. I don't recall. But the the title of the article was NFL player living like he only makes $60,000 a year. Now, and I, re- that. I retweeted I've that, that. And I said, I said, <laughs> NFL player living like I've he's making that. 60 grand a year while UFC fighters wish they made 60 grand a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, rap. I'm, I'm getting told I need to wrap it up. And, uh, uh, I tell you, oh, it's been awesome having you on the show, man. We appreciate it. And, uh, we surely would like to get you back on the show sometime. Uh, you want to give a right shout-out to shout out 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 Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, my own personal product project that I'm working on right now, the thing that keeps me busy and out of trouble, is Zombie Cage Fighter. If you go to zombiecagefighter.com, you can get a free PDF of my comic book. And what it is, it's my biographical horror story, what I've been through as a fighter and as a father, and then I threw in zombies. So everybody asks how, how they can support the fighters, this is one way directly. Zombie Cage Fighter, 100% me. I'm financing the entire thing. Every shirt that gets made, I'm the one that's out there approving the design, approving the print, the comic book. I'm working with some phenomenal artists that are making my dream come true. Past weekend, I was at the Rose City Con, Con selling T-shirts and comic books and interacting with fans for 10-hour days and just having a blast. So please, even if you don't want to buy a hard copy of the comic or a T-shirt, Go to the website. You can enter in your email address so I can keep you up to date with the happenings. You can get a free PDF, the Zombie Cage Rider comic, and just spread the word because, man, I'm having so much fun telling the story and getting support from people. It's it's really cool. Awesome. That's awesome. Just one more quick question for a fan. Is there a fight that you wanted but never got for one reason or another, and do you still want it? For myself, uh the big one that I did want that I got was Caleb Starnes. And the one, the reason for that, long story short, was he had insulted me before the fight, said I wasn't worthy to fight him. And so I said to Joe Silva, the matchmaker, all right, I'll fight Pete Sell. Then I'm going to fight Caleb Starnes. And when I do, I'm going to end his career, which I did. <laughs> that was the fight, that, the fight that, that, that I should have asked for was the winner between Florian and Sanchez. So we could see who really deserved to be the middleweight ultimate fighter of season one. Uh, a fight that I, I wanted and never got should have been probably Bisping. I should have called him out early when he was in the UFC. But 
I'm not somebody that likes to call out people because to me, fighting is such a personal thing. And for me, I fight best when I'm filled with rage and I'm really angry at the opponent. But I thought a fight that would have been fun would have been me versus BJ Penn. And, and uh, <clears throat> I say that, and it sounds kind of ridiculous, but BJ Penn's fought Machida. He's fought at 205 and is just a flat out fighter. And I. Yeah, he was on my show in 2012 on Spike TV, MMA Uncensored. We went out afterwards. We were sitting around drinking, and I said, BJ, you know, buddy, I want to tell you something. I hope you don't get upset, but I always wanted to fight you. I thought, I think that a fight with you would be fun, and I don't think that about fighting with anybody. I just thought that if I was fighting you and you beat me, I'd be like, that's cool. I fought BJ Penn, and if I beat you, <laughs> I'd be like, it's cool, man. He's still my buddy. I love this guy. And BJ looked at me, and he gives me this big hug and goes, brother, that's why I love you, man. You're a real fighter. There's not very many of us left out there. That's exactly right. And you are a real fighter. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think Is there anything else you want to say, <laughs> HR? I, I, I'm good. Uh, Nate, it was a pleasure interviewing you. Uh, I hope the best for you and, and whatever you do. And uh, and surely hope that uh, the fighters get what they deserve and uh, – and uh, have a great night, and uh, thank you very much for coming on Inside the Salem. It's been an honor to talk to you, man. Well, thank you very much for having me on, and, yeah, thank you, thank you for giving me a voice and helping to stand up for the fire. We need your help, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have have a great evening, Nate. Thank you. All right. Ooh, Waylon, man, what a interview, huh? I mean, yeah, man. I mean, we could just go on and on and on, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I I, I just uh, couldn't shut up there for a minute, but <laughs> uh, I know uh, I know if Jason had been here, boy, Jason would have had some good stuff for him. Uh, really miss Jason being on the show tonight, and uh, I always look forward to uh, talking with Jason. And uh, Waylon, you got anything you want to? Want to add for tonight? And yeah, just talking to Nate Corey. I mean, to me, he's a legend. I've been a fan ever since. You know, like I said, uh, the Ultimate Fighter season one, and for him to do all the things that he's done, especially for the fighters and that you know the Jacob uh, Beckman situation, that was just it's just an honor to talk to him. You know what I mean? You just learn so much, especially. It's funny how all the fighters that we're talking to, they're just so intelligent. You know, I feel so dumb <laughs> whenever I talk to them. Well, I mean, you know, you know they've been through it. So they've much. experienced it, and, and they, they've been there and, and been through the treatment, you know, and, and they're they're fully aware of what, what you know, how they've been treating, and, and I guess that's what brought this all along because, you know, they just want what's right, man. And Yeah. And that's what the fighters should get. I mean, they need a, some intelligent people to really speak for them, you know, because a lot of fighters are really scared to talk. They're afraid they're going to lose their contract or, you know, get a bump in the road from Dana White. So they need some people like this, especially to have yeah. a name and, you know, hopefully they can get all this stuff situated. I, I, I honestly believe more and more people are getting educated and getting more aware of uh, – of uh, you know what's going on, and uh, you know maybe we can step this thing up and and That's timeline exactly right. and uh, get the show on the road. Uh, you know I kind of think with the Nate Diaz uh, deal with uh, these, you know I heard the flyweight division, and uh, I, I know Leslie Smith and uh, Henry Cahuda, uh, they said they're not fighting in Nevada no more. So maybe that will encourage some of the uh, some of the fighters that uh, for the Ali Act to uh, you know push them a little bit and start to, hey, man, if they can do it, we can do it too, huh? So yeah. It, it'd be interesting to look and see. And, uh, and, uh, and the fans yeah, have we'll, a big role too. I mean, if the fans would just stop watching and just, you know, pretty much be like, we're sick of the UFC. We're sick of how they're treating everybody. They're, you know, we Dana White <clears throat> pretty much tells his customers, hey, go F off. You know what I mean? If you don't like what I say, then ha-ha. I make more money than you. And if yeah. the fans would just say, hey, we're not going to watch this anymore, we'll just go to Bellator or World, World Series Fighting, you know, that's all we need. We just need something to, like yeah. what you said earlier, we need we need more education yeah. for this, you know. People need to be educated, in the, okay, especially with we're all gonna the have stuff to, going on. 
we're going to have to shut it down. Uh, our, I'm being told our next week's guest will be announced soon, so stay tuned with uh, Inside the Asylum. Uh, check with uh, MMAMadhouse.com. Follow them on Facebook, Twitter, uh, GlobalCombatNetwork.com. Follow them on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, yeah. follow me at uh, HR Jimmy Baker on Facebook, Jimmy underscore Baker 34 on Twitter, and Shake and Bake 3476 on Instagram. Waylon? And follow me on Waylon Thacker, just YouTube. Just hit up Waylon Thacker and you'll find me on there. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll see you next week inside the Salem Support Local MMA.